Okay, our next guest speaker is Thad Williamson from U of R, and here he is. Hello. Sorry I'm overdressed, but it was me cold with that jacket, so. Um, I'm really more of a writer than an impromptu speaker like uh, Councilman Jewell. Um, so bear with me, I'm going to be largely operating off this text. Um, but basically, first, I'm really delighted to be here in solidarity with all of you, Occupy Richmond, and with the Occupy Wall Street, and really the worldwide social movement against oligarchy and for democracy. And this movement, I think, is one of the most heartening things to happen in our country in recent decades. Because what it shows is that the American people are not yet totally inert. The councilman just gave you some statistics on income inequality and how it's grown. And he said, I totally agree. The worst thing about it is no one has spoken up. No one has really done anything serious about it in, until now. And it shows, this movement shows that the heartbeat of democracy is still thumping. Despite all the apathy and cynicism, consumerism we see all around us, the heartbeat is still there. It hasn't completely died. Sometimes I think that, sometimes other people think that, but it's still there. That, that's, that's a hopeful thing. And so I think this movement is showing that Americans and people worldwide are not going to take the domination of our political economic system by the rich lying down. Now, I have uh, so I have two goals in my talk today. The first is I want to explain why the Occupy movement is fundamentally a just and righteous and whatever good word you want to put on it, cause. And the second is I want to put out some ideas for how this movement could grow and become not just a fleeting episodic moment of democracy, but part of a sustained effort to create a more just a more democratic economy and society that, break, that breaks decisively with the last 30 years of American capitalism. <coughs> the economic justice anti-oligarchy movement is and must be the civil rights movement of the 21st century. And you can clap for that too, but I mean it not as a slogan. Not just a slogan, but indicate that we have a lot of work ahead of us. So the civil rights struggle for African Americans in Richmond and throughout the South and throughout the entire country it took place over decades and it required incredible determined persistence and resilience over many years and many setbacks and in fact that movement still has unfinished work as everybody living in Richmond well understands yes. but there's a fundamental continuity between the struggle for racial justice and the struggle for economic justice both here in Richmond and around the country the Occupy events this fall had the potential to spark a new civil rights movement around questions of wealth, power, and ensuring we have a society that runs to the benefit of all 100%, not just the top 1%. But we have to understand this is only the beginning, only the beginning of a long struggle that must be waged on a variety of fronts over years, decades. Now, at this point, a lot of the basic uh, information about income and wealth and quality in the United States are well known, uh, but they can't be uh, overstressed. So the top 1% has about 38% of total wealth uh, in the United States and over 20% of income, which is a dramatic increase since the 70s. And at the same time, over that time period, as the councilman said, the wages and incomes of ordinary families have stagnated or even gone backward. This has been the case, even though year in and year out, workers have become more and more productive. The workers of today are much more productive than the workers of the 1970s, but wages have not proportionally gone up, not even close. Instead, the gains have been captured by the capitalist class, the corporate shareholders, and in effect, the top 1%. Now, no serious person denies what these trends are. They're well-established, 
They're in, I mean, they're in the books. So they're long established statistical trends. People have given up trying to disprove that that's what the facts are. But some people in the media still want to claim, well, it's this great mystery as to why inequality has increased. That reminds me of back in the 60s, uh, conservative segregation says it's, it's a great mystery as to why uh, uh, Richmond is such a segregated place. People, who knows what would happen? Well, well, it's not a mystery. What they, what they want to convince you is, is that somehow inequality is just a necessary byproduct of trends that are basically good, such as technological improvement or, or more trade. But in fact, you know, that's not, those are not the root causes. If, and far from being a necessary evil, the stagnation of American worker uh, incomes are the root cause of the depression we have today. Good. So, but I do want to get into a little of this question, why did inequality increase? So sure, there are lots of different factors involved. But here are the most uh, fundamental two points. First, there was a, concert, a concerted effort to hold wages down in the 1970s that, uh, that accelerated in the 80s by repressing labor unions, refusing to raise the minimum wage, and refusing to make full employment the basis of economic policy. And we can thank our friends at the Richmond Fed for that, among others. Uh, unions have been in a downward spiral since the 70s, and it's gotten harder and harder to organize or to win a strike. <laughs> And I have the greatest admiration for those people in the labor movement who have stuck with it over all that time. But the fact is that they and we are struggling on a battlefield that has been drastically tilted against labor. So that's the first thing, flat out repression of labor. At the top end, we have to look at the corporate managers who make up about 40% of this richest 1%. How they have prioritized increasing their own salaries and compensation over actually contributing value to society by productive economic activity. Thank you. Incentives have been skewed so the CEOs get paid more when their stock share price goes up. But it's easier to make uh, share prices go up in a hurry on Wall Street by cutting workers and providing quick dividend returns than by overseeing firms that sustain jobs over the long term. You know, Ooh. CEOs have gotten rich in effect by firing workers. That's her alley since the 80s. And these CEO salaries have skyrocketed since the 70s and 80s, which accounts for a huge chunk of why the share of the top 1% has grown so much in the U.S. And this really has nothing to do with economic efficiency, and it's not because these corporate managers are so much more brilliant yeah. than the managers of enterprises 50 years ago or the managers of, of corporations in Europe and elsewhere. It's simply the result of a power play by CEOs within corporations to prioritize getting rich themselves over creating jobs, and, 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 and doing productive things for society. Thank you. Yeah. And also the utter failure of government <gasps> to regulate this compensation. Yeah. And, and you all know the story. I mean, even after the Wall Street bailout kicked in, the bonuses, the obscene bonuses continued. Yes. And at numerous companies such as GE and Coca-Cola, CEO compensation, that is the amount of money the CEO is getting from the corporation, actually exceeds the amount of taxation the company pays to the federal government. And indeed, some of those companies, yeah, <laughs> I'll give you the precise number since I happen to remember this. At the 100 companies where the CEOs are the best paid, the 25 of those companies, including GE and Coca-Cola, the CEO pay is larger than what they're paying in taxes to the federal government. So get your head around that for a second. I mean, some of these corporations are getting rebates from the federal government because they've succeeded in rewriting laws that benefit themselves. Okay. And in fact, some of these companies actually spend more money on lobbying than they do on uh, paying taxes. Okay. So, how do these trends of stagnant income and growing inequality hurt the economy? Well, when this trend first started back in the 70s, 80s, in the 80s, American households compensated by increasing their work hours. So women increased their working hours a lot and two full-time jobs became the norm for working families. And that allowed household income to grow uh, for a while, even as wages remained flat. For a while. Then after that trend had tapped out in the 1990s, people began to finance their consumption by borrowing via credit cards. And wealthier households made paper profits for a while through the internet stock bubble before it crashed. Later in the 2000s, uh, many households used the housing bubble to finance spending. So instead of financing increased spending in a growing economy out of real increases in income for ordinary people, 
basically we've kept the economy, the capitalist machine going through mountains and mountains of debt. And in 2008, this is not what I originally wrote, but I'm going to say is the chickens came home to roost, or alternatively something else hit the fan. And, uh, and, and the economy began to collapse once it became evident that the so-called geniuses on Wall Street had placed enormous gambles on derivatives that they really did not understand. They did not understand what they owned. Well, I would like to be able to tell you that then what happened is that we elected President Barack Obama and he came and he saved the day. But we probably wouldn't be here this afternoon if that were true. The truth is Obama had a narrow opening in which he could have charted a fundamentally different course to the economy. And at times, he spoke like that's what he would do. Maybe that's, in fact, what he did want to do. But the fact is, the policies his economic team pursued, the policies developed by the people he appointed, did not hold Wall Street accountable for the mess created, nor did they take the steps required to be sure that such a crisis can never happen again. The financial sector is still dominated by huge entities that are too big to fail, and the line between banks and investment firms has not been redrawn. There hasn't been enough regulation of derivatives. The Consumer Protection Commission has been watered down. At the same time, unemployment has remained unacceptably high, and poverty is at its highest level right now that it's been in decades in our country. So, you know, in 2008, Barack Obama, I, I think, was the living embodiment of the American people's desire to chart a different course, to reject the way we've been going the last 30 years. And I supported him then as such. Today, unfortunately, he's in danger of becoming the living embodiment of a political system that's broken. That cannot achieve its own goals and is too dominated by private interests on Wall Street to solve the problems that affect everyone. And that's why we're here today, or a big part of the reason. The economy is broken, the political system is broken for the same reason. The excessive influence of powerful corporations and the wealthy were determined to turn this country into an oligarchy, a country no matter who is elected, the big bankers and the corporate interests remain in charge. Now, lots of people who are not here have been making all kinds of claims about the Occupy movement and what it's about. Some people say this is the left-wing Tea Party. Well, let me say a couple of things about that. First, the Tea Party might have been for about five minutes an independent populist uprising, but now it's essentially a, a tool of the right-wing Republican Party fully bankrupt, bankrolled by corporate interests. Woo! That's what it is. Koch brothers. And I don't think it's any surprise that the polls show that, that we are much more popular than the Tea Party. Yeah. Oh! But second, I do give some credit to the Tea Party true believers. They at least were not totally inert. At least they recognized that something was wrong. Unfortunately, they don't understand that's what wrong is a direct result of the regressive anti-labor agenda that they espouse. And that has essentially governed Washington for the last 30 years. Okay. Another thing people say is that the movement should list a bunch of demands. And some of the people are saying that because they are genuinely baffled about what this is all about. Or because they don't want the movement to peter out without any concrete victories. But others are saying it uh, because, in effect, they want all of you to go home and let the politicians take care of it. Well, I say to you today is, is you can't go home and we can't go home. None of us can go home. And then this movement cannot go away if it's going to achieve anything. So, and I was very pleased that Councilman Jewell basically said the same thing just now, okay? Now, be sure there are tons of good ideas out there, specific ideas for reform and for change, you know, from, from small things to revolutionary things. I mean, even the White House says some of them. If you're interested in detailed, genuinely progressive proposals that for our new architecture of the economy, I would uh, urge you to follow very closely the work that Bernie Sanders the, the, the senator from Vermont is doing right now. He's putting together a group of economists. These are the smart economists, not the idiot ones. These are smart economists. The people who, who told us that a crash was coming. He's, he put together a whole team of them to talk about how can we seriously redo the Fed, for instance, to make an actual democratic institution. How, how can we re-regulate an architecture that makes sense and gets us back on the, having an economy for people and for employment and not for pay for profits. So I would pay attention to what he's doing. But, I, but really, the key thing I want to say is that no matter what your ideas are, it just doesn't matter how good they are if you don't have power. So this movement has to be, I think, is fundamentally about claiming and building up the power of the 99%. This is about the 99% asserting ourselves 
saying we're here, saying we're not going away quietly and hope to cut a backroom deal to get to our, our former two yes. and make sure everybody shut up. Thank you. And as long as we're here, we might as well educate ourselves and start the conversation America so badly needs, the conversation that really should have started in this country you know, two decades ago. And it's a conversation about this. How do we build an economy that truly saw, uh, serves all of us, that respects the dignity of every worker and every person, and allows each of us to live decently and to flourish? <laughs> now, a third thing people have been saying out there in the media is that the Occupy movement consists of hypocrites. They say that it doesn't make any sense to criticize oligarchy or criticize the economic system at the same time we are using cell phones, iPhones, <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, and all the other modern communication tools. But that argument rests on a myth and a lie. Okay, The myth is that having a situation in which Wall Street interests dominate both the economy and the political apparatus is somehow a necessary condition for having a modern economy. In fact, the domination of Wall Street and the draft to deregulate is what has brought down the economy, not only causing the deepest and most serious a recession in two generations, but also blocking the kinds of responses needed to prevent it from happening again. So the idea that banking deregulation, unregulated derivatives trading, and irresponsible and greedy behavior by the nation's financiers led the economy to collapse uh, is not crazy talk. It's the informed view, not just of us, but of many well-informed uh, economists and insiders, including quite a few who predicted exactly what would happen years in advance, and nobody listened. Nothing would advance the cause of economic rationality and progress more than taking back uh, the power to, to regulate and shape how the economy uh, works from Wall Street. Okay, So let me just put that in really simple terms, because I, I know that was a uh, sort of mouthful there. But, but uh, it's just absurd to say that letting Wall Street have their way is good for the economy. The last 20 years has completely proved us false. Yes. Okay. That's the myth. Now, now here's the lie. The lie is the, is the idea that our cu current communication tools, our computers and our cell phones are the result of a few brilliant innovators like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, and that their brilliant innovation justifies the concentration of wealth we see in the United States today. Okay, this is a lie in two ways. First, as a point of fact, the majority of those in the top 1% of income are not these entrepreneurial innovators or high-tech people. Or are the athletes or entertainers like Michael Jordan and Oprah Winfrey that people like to cite as examples of why you know, uh, we, we should allow people to be rich? It, really, the majority of the top 1% consists of people working in the finance industry or people who are in the top levels of management and corporations. That is the very people who have again and again rewritten the rules of the economy in their own favor over the past 40 years. But beyond that, it, it's just not true that innovation and technology is a product of individual genius or entrepreneurial vision. And, and this is sort of a, a heavy thought I'm going to try to drop on you. We'll see if it <laughs> plops or not. Okay. Okay. So, you know, Al Gore did not invent the internet. True. But the United States government did. And the government also created the first mainframe computer in World War II, which is itself built on counting machines developed by the Census Bureau earlier in the 20th century. The foundational computing computer language basic, which some of you may remember from back in the 80s, uh, was developed with a government grant. In countless ways, we the people with our tax dollars have underwritten the development of computers and internet technology, as well as numerous other crucial fields from energy to aviation to health research. So the idea that, 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 that only the private sector, only entrepreneurs as individuals create value, is just t totally, I mean, it's a BS, okay? But the point I wanna make is even deeper than this. The technology we see around us the highly concentrated wealth you see around us rests on a common human inheritance of knowledge. So, yay for Bill Gates, yay for Steve Jobs, RIP, etc. But those guys could not have existed 100 years ago. The innovations of today rest on the knowledge developed in the past, as well as on the sweat of workers who created a society that allows some people to specialize in developing knowledge and technology. So, the great technological breakthroughs of today and of tomorrow, in a moral sense, belong to all of us. And there's nothing wrong, in my opinion, with creating incentives to reward new innovations that benefit everyone. But it's critical that we assure that these new technologies and the wealth they generate are, in fact, used to benefit all of us and not to further concentrate the profit and power of corporations and the super rich. We as a public health pay for them, and we as human beings each 
have a moral claim to benefit from the accumulated, accumulated knowledge of our predecessors. Yes. Oh. So spreading the wealth around, creating an economy that works for the 100% rather than the 1% is a precondition of having a genuinely democratic society. And here's something that may shock you. In practice, it really would not be that hard to accomplish if we were serious about it. And, and this is a function of just how concentrated the wealth is at the top. And you have to get your head, I mean, it's taking me a long time to get my head around what it really means to have 1% own well over a third of the wealth. But one thing it means is if we distributed even one third of that wealth owned by the top 1% to everyone else, we could assure that every household right now in the United States had $100,000. <laughs> that would be a dramatic change. I think it would change everything. It would change the way people. Yeah, me too. It would change the uh, the way people think about life. It would change the position of labor and society. Uh, you know, that would be what economic democracy would look like. Okay, and another way to think about it is it would be just rolling back rich people to the money they had when Reagan started as president. And they'd still be pretty rich. But, but the, the pie is more than big enough to go around and have everyone in the society live comfortably, have a measure of security, be able to live the life that they want to live and not the, a life driven all the time by economic need. That society is possible. It's just not that hard to achieve uh, in, in, in mathematical terms, in numerical terms. It's politics is the barrier. So, and really, if the Occupy movement does ever settle on a long-term demand or goal, that would be my vote put that on the table. Yes. Give everybody a real piece of the pie. But we have a lot of work to do to get to that point. So I'm going to close by talking about some more immediate steps uh, that can be taken to build a democratic economy from the bottom up. And you know, to create a more equitable economy, there are really two ways to go. The first is to try to redistribute, which I just talked about. And I support that, but it's difficult to achieve. I don't think it's what I just voted for is going to be voted in by Congress tomorrow or next year. But, but, but that, we've got to put it on the table, but, but that's a ways off, okay? So that's one way is to redistribute what's already there. The second way is to create new forms of wealth going forward and new forms of economic organization that are democratic and equitable from the very beginning. So how can we do that? So here, here are five specific things to think about. First, uh, and, and, and our households in the process of doing this, let's move our money from corporate bank accounts to credit unions for truly local banks and move our spending away from big chains to local businesses, especially those that treat workers yeah. fairly. Second, let's get involved in, in support of the efforts of local workers here in Richmond in organizing struggles for better wages and conditions. Um, you know, one of the things that happens when there's a recession is, is that the bossers get meaner because they can. And that's been going on and it's been going on for the entire 30 year period and it's gotten worse in this recession. So I mean, there are some organizing efforts in different places around town going on or, or about to blow up into the big time and I, I want all of us to, to be down there supporting that. Uh, third, we must realize that waiting on corporations to come in and create a bunch of good jobs to improve things here in Richmond is not a good development strategy. It's not good on its own terms and also it's a pipe dream. Okay. So to repeat, waiting on corporations, the idea that what's going to solve Richmond is having some companies from the outside come in and hire and provide good jobs. That's going to solve our problems. And that, that's a myth. A, I don't think it's going to happen. And B, what would really happen is there'd be a lot of subsidies paid to those companies and they would hire a bunch of people who don't live here. It's not going to do very much at all for, for, for the, the, the uh, people in Churchill, people all around our city who need entry level work. Uh, who need uh, skill or semi-skilled positions. It's, it's just not going to do anything but ordinary working class people in the city. We need to be a lot more creative than that. We need a creative community development strategy that creates long-term stable jobs that employs the people living here now. now. This can be done by creating worker cooperatives, nonprofit corporations, and genuinely local small businesses. So I want to talk about what's going on in Cleveland, Ohio. I mean, this is a community, they fall on hard times They've had you know, huge population loss going back over decades, but they've got their act together now. They've gotten the entire uh, community uh, behind uh, what's called the Evergreen Cooperatives Movement. Okay, And basically, their goal is to try to develop 
uh, something on the model of the Mondragon system of cooperatives in Spain, which is this huge network of different cooperatives that started in the 50s. It's now one of the biggest employers in all of Spain. They went to about $50 million and have a dozen uh, startup firms, all of which will be cooperatives, all of which will be cutting edge green technology in their fields, all of which will be meeting local needs and employing local people. And this is not just talk, it's actually happened. It started for these businesses already. Uh, uh, and they've been put to work doing laundry for, for the for the universities and for the hospitals in the area and, and putting up solar plants stuff. They started a newspaper. They started a, a, a green garden kind of thing to, to produce food for the city. And they, and they have uh, seven or eight more businesses in development. Okay, that, that's what a, a real community development strategy looks like. Because they made the moral priority we're going to employ the people who live here, and we're not going to just treat you as a worker. We're going to make you feel like you own this by literally giving you ownership. So, so that the workers uh, are going to be invested. Uh, they get uh, uh, a living wage plus, plus health benefits plus a share uh, of stock. And and the idea is for the success of each of these firms to spin off and create revenues to allow new firms to be created. So this is and this is really essential because you know there's lots of cooperatives around. But, but they tend to be isolated, they don't grow up to enough scale. And, and the way to overcome that is through networking and, and putting capital together in a very practical way. And it's starting to happen in Cleveland. The other thing I would say about, about the piece in Cleveland is they got the heavy hitters. They got some of these tall buildings on board. Now, maybe not that one right there, which is Williams Mullen. But, uh, but, but, but they got the big hospitals, they got the big universities uh, who are you know, huge employers in all uh, cities, including here. They got them on board with this program because they recognized, look, we got to do something about the, the conditions here uh, in Cleveland. Uh, th th this is bad for us to have our community falling apart. So what I would say is, and this is an example of a fundamentally bottom-up uh, movement, but it's also got enough top-down support that they can get the money and the capital they need to get this thing off the ground. And that's the kind of you know creative thinking I would love to see come to Richmond. Yes. It has to happen. Yes. Everything else has been tried. Well, yes. To me, we've been, we've been led down the, the down the false path of, of, of these corporate driven strategies you know, for decades, and they write these reports and they have yeah, yeah. Uh, really good analysis of Richmond and so forth. And then the solution is always, you know, let the corporate yeah. leader solve it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we got to have a different model. Yeah. Woo. Okay. Yeah. Fourth thing I want to say is, while direct action to create new alternatives is always welcome and it's never been more needed. At the end of the day, we cannot avoid engaging with politics in the political process. It's the political process that sets the rules we all live by. And I would suggest, uh, in particular here in Richmond, we cannot avoid engaging that other, much less democratic General Assembly that's in town, the one over there in the state capitol. So this city, Richmond, does not get its fair share of funding for schools. Um, we live under a system of metropolitan segregation and how it happened for decades, that can only be changed by the General Assembly. The practices that hurt labor in the state systematically can only be changed by the General Assembly. We need to take the struggle to the statewide arena. Now, the corporate lobby in this state, they think they own the General Assembly. I mean, I've talked oh, yeah. to them. They say that. Yes, they do. And more than often than not, yeah, more often than not, they're right. And until we challenge that, we in Richmond are going to be left to fight with one another over scraps because of the bad hand we've been dealt with by the state of Virginia. Yep. That has to be challenged. This has to be, become a statewide movement. Yes. Challenge is politics as usual in the, in the assembly. And, and finally, and maybe this is the most important thing, is we need to continue this educational process, and especially the process of learning about alternatives from around the country and the world. All around the world, there are amazing initiatives and experiments going on in genuine economic democracy through worker-owned firms, community land trust, community-based social enterprises, genuine community-based banks, municipal businesses and loan funds, and on and on and on. There are also amazing initiatives and experiments in genuine political democracy, such as the idea of participatory budgeting, which is essentially letting ordinary people do the work of setting budget priorities at the local level so as to meet their urgent local needs. We can do that in Richmond. It's being done in other cities. We, 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 we could, we, I mean, Mr. Jewell just basically invited us to lean on him. We could say, hey, Mr. Jewell, let's turn over your pot of money you get from the city and let, let, let us plan as a community in a grassroots way how to use that money as opposed to you deciding by fiat. 
know, I mean, I don't know how he used some of his money. He did some good things, but but, but that's a simple way to, to introduce uh, democracy. And I believe in Chicago, there's actually a, uh, they also have sort of a, a ward system where one of the people ran on that platform and won. The, the, uh, if I win, I'll, I'll make I'll make the money. How how it's been a matter of popular decision, and that caught on. And now you know dozens of those guys are, are starting to do that. Okay, and so we need to. Uh, Study these, alter these alternatives, learn about them, and then think about how we can make them happen in Richmond. You know, there are a lot of people in this town that we will never convince with our brilliant rhetoric and speeches or, or with our theoretical arguments or anything like that. But you can convince more than you would think if you show them a model that works and makes sense and is practical. And seriously, I mean, these are desperate times, and anything that works to create jobs and uplift dignity and it actually works is going to be welcomed. Not just by us, but really, I mean, the people in the mayor's office, the people on city council, they're going to get it. If they see that it works, they're going to be behind it. And it's just really up to us to bring that creativity and learn from it that's going on all over the, around the world and, and think about how do we make it happen here, given what we have. So. My closing, uh, oh, by the way, uh, one resource to, to think about uh, uh, is a website called community-wealth.org that -O -O has tons of examples if you're looking for, for more stuff uh, on, on economic democracy. So my, my, yeah, community-wealth, there's a dash in there, dot .org, sure. Okay, so my closing thought is that in this movement, what we do ourselves as people, as individuals, will be as important, if not more so, than what we demand of others. So our challenge is to build a movement that both demands social justice and democracy and finds creative ways to practice it. So really, thank you to all of you who brought this movement to Richmond. Let's work together to show that another better world is as possible as it is necessary. Thanks. Thank you. Oh,